Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Lindy Ruano and I am with Easter Seals of Southern California and the Disability Tribe Initiative. Today's live webinar, Bridge the Gap for the LGBTQ plus and disability communities will be offering Spanish and ASL interpretation. Para las personas que necesitan o prefieren el español, pueden hacer clic en el icono con el globo blanco en la parte baja de su pantalla, que dice Interpretation. Después haga clic en Spanish. Usted tendrá la opción de silenciar el audio original y podrá escuchar la voz de Rubén Ruiz traduciendo en vivo. En el canal de español, si selecciona Mute Original Audio, entonces nada más escuchará la voz del intérprete. Si no hace clic en Mute el Original Audio, entonces escuchará la voz de los presentadores de habla inglés al fondo. Our ASL interpreters are Don and Lorelai. They have been spotlighted so they can always be seen throughout the presentation. Depending on your device, this may mean that sometimes you cannot see the presenter. We apologize for the inconvenience, but we want to make sure that this live meeting and recording can be accessible to everyone. This presentation will have closed captioning, which you can access using the button at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. A few things to note about Zoom before we get started. This meeting is being recorded to allow us to go back and just to go back to the discussion of today and the input we receive. You can hear and see us, but we cannot hear and see you. Everyone has been automatically put on mute and your camera is not on. Chat is not activated for attendees. However, presenters will be sharing some information through the chat during the webinar. If you would like to ask questions or provide a comment, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We also ask that you indicate which presenter you would like to send the question to. We have staff monitoring and responding as necessary. Some questions will be answered in real time. Some will be saved for the live Q&A at the end, or we may ask you to provide us with an email address so that we can follow up with a more thorough answer at, after the webinar. For those of you on a phone or a device, you may not be able to use all the features we discussed. We'll be providing other options for you to have access to the materials or ask questions later in the webinar. Finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will be asking you to participate in our post-event survey. Once the webinar is over, a new window will pop open with the survey. Please provide your feedback so we can improve on future events. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Amber Carey Navarrete, Director of Person Center Services at Easter Seal Southern California. Thank you. Amber? Thank you, Lindy. And thank you to all of you in attendance for showing up today to learn how the supports and services you use or provide can be a more welcoming and inclusive space for the LGBTQ plus disability community. Happy Pride, everyone. Also, know that this is the perfect time within the alternative services model to finally bridge the gap to creating services that support the whole person and their whole identity. We want to do more than just connect people to all the communities they identify with. People tell us that they want more. They want to have meaningful roles within the intersection of all their different communities. We are talking about the places where people feel they can be themselves the spaces where they feel they belong, and even more so being with the people who love them for who they are and who they are ever becoming. Many services out there are already redesigning their documentation and practices to address the changing needs of COVID. Why not at the same time include the needs of the LGBTQ plus disability community as well? We have included a lot of information on how to do this in today's slides. There is much more information than our presenters will be able to cover in detail. I invite you all to just listen and learn today. The slides are available in both English and Spanish, and you can access them through the links in the chat. 
you will also be able to access them on the Disability Thrive Initiative website following the webinar. Lastly, some of the topics we will be discussing today have historically been ignored or taboo within the disability community. Topics such as identity, relationships, sexuality, and more. I invite all of you to open your mind and your hearts to discover how wonderful it can be to truly embrace and get to know someone's whole self. Specifically, the topics today's webinar are covering are a personal account about why it is important for services to bridge the gap for LGBTQ plus people with disabilities, a person-centered approach to supporting LGBTQ plus individuals, and also gender recognition plans. You are going to find that we have many, many resources embedded within the slide deck here to help you find the support and education you may be looking for. Next slide. I would now like to introduce today's presenters. First is Harmony Tarrant, an independent living skills instructor with the Dale McIntosh Center. Also, Rhiannon Maycumber, a person-centered thinking trainer with Westside Regional Center and has been working on LGBTQ plus organizational development work at Westside Regional Center for the last three years. And Montserrat Vargas, an integrated living program supervisor with Ability Path. Montserrat is a proud queer Latina trans woman. Whenever she is not working at Ability Path or getting her engineering license, she enjoys going out to dance at her local bar ballroom. So without further ado, I would like to pass the webinar over to Harmony. Thank you so much, Harmony. We appreciate you being here with us today. Hey, everybody. Can you see and hear me? So. Yes, we All can. Right. All right. So my name is Harmony Parent, and I am the Independent Learning Skills Instructor at the Dale Macintosh Center. I help people with disabilities become more independent by helping them reach goals they want to achieve. But I wasn't always an independent living skills instructor. I was born with a disability called Dr. L syndrome, and I am also a trans man. I grew up in Texas, and I didn't grow up in the best of circumstances. I was emotionally and physically abused and was basically told I didn't have a disability. And I was shamed and abused for even wanting to express myself masculinely. Every facet of my life was controlled. What I ate, what I wore, if I could socialize, etc., was chosen for me and I was shamed and abused if I tried to deviate from what my mom picked out for me. I would try to put my hair in a ponytail whenever I could. I tried to avoid wearing makeup. Sometimes I snuck on my brother's clothes when nobody was around. Every time I tried to do these things, though, they threatened my safety in my own home. Home videotape evidence says I knew what I was a boy when I was three years old. But I only remember when I was eight, I made every single one of my stuffed animals a boy because I couldn't be one. As much as I wanted to pursue myself and how I express myself to the world, I couldn't do that until I was an adult and out of that house. Even then, I didn't know what trans was until I was in college. There was no rep representation in Texas whatsoever, and I didn't have access to internet. When I did find out what trans was, something clicked inside of me, but it made me scared. When you have a disability, people tend to underestimate you, and they tend to think that you can't think for yourself, that you don't actually know what you want which can turn into a personal insecurity. I was scared that I was wrong for feeling this way, that I didn't know what I wanted because that's how people treated me. I was also terrified that even if I was trans, that nobody would accept me and I would lose all the support I recently gained. So I kept it inside for a while until people in college would misgender me as a man and I liked it. At this point, I did have the internet 
and trans people were on my feed, and I got to research more into it. I started to, in addition to my masculine attire, wear binders and packers and let people call me a guy whenever I could. It was the most freedom I felt in a long time, probably ever. Once I was more comfortable with the identity, I changed my gender to male on Facebook. But my dad told me I could never be a boy and it would confuse other people. I cried and put away all of my trans gear in, in fear of my dad being right and in fear of losing support. But then one day I got referred to the Dale McIntosh Center as a consumer. Because of my disability and how I grew up, I had no living skills. I had to be taught how to ride a bus, how to cook, how to clean, pretty much anything you can think of that involves independent living skills, I had to be taught for the first time as an adult. After a while, I was invited to volunteer at the youth program at BMC to teach about system ad advocacy. And the first thing that one of the staff said to me was, you know, I see that you present yourself very masculinely. Would you like to introduce yourself as he, him? I was shocked because I was never asked that in my life. And I didn't know that was a thing that I could do. I kept asking on the way, are you sure that's okay? This is a thing that I can do? So at the youth program, I was known as a man and everyone accepted me as such. This gave me a space to live as a man in a, I guess you could say, in a controlled environment so that I could know if this felt comfortable without anyone else telling me how I should feel. That kind of support gave me the space to be myself and recognize that this was something that I want. This is something that I am. Not only that, but it proved to me that I can be trans and still have a support system. I can still have people who accept me for who I am. Because of this support, I was able to come out in other parts of my life as a man, such as the Toastmasters group I was part of. Kind of came out to my therapist and we talked about gender stuff and hormones being an option. And I also came out to my family again, who were more supportive now that I could explain myself better with therapy and personal experience because of that support. After about a year, I started to pursue hormone replacement, hormone replacement therapy. Everyone now tells me how much I'm smiling and laughing since then. Whereas before, I didn't do much of that at all. To be honest, if I didn't have that support at DMC, if I wasn't asked how I wanted to present myself, I don't know that I would have made it this far. I might have just been passive to other people's comfortability about me and never pursued transition. And I wouldn't be nearly this happy or confident about myself. Being able to have that support and that space at DMC helped me be the man that I am today. It helped me gain the confidence that I know what I want and I'm going to pursue what I want, which is the most freedom you could ever give to someone. DMC not only helps me with my independence in a direct way with the independent living skills program and, and leadership positions, but it helped me with my independence by accepting who I am without question and letting me decide that for myself. Supporting our consumers, especially with LGBT identities, is going to be one of the most important work that we do because that individual may ha not have ever experienced support before. That consumer might not have the confidence to know that they can express themselves so if they don't get that support, they might not be able to tap into and express their true selves and their true potential. 
not only is it depressing to live your life in accordance to other people, it's also not your life you're living, but a shadow of others. And if you notice, we humans are a pack animal, a tribe species. We survive off of support and we recluse or die without it. A lot of people don't live their own life until they get that support, that permission to live life on their terms. Give your consumers the permission to be themselves. Give your consumers the space to be themselves in a safe environment. And I promise you, their potential will skyrocket. Um, and I can popcorn it and hand it over to Rhiannon. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Harmony, for sharing that incredibly vulnerable story with us. And I'm so glad that the folks on here will have an opportunity to, to learn from your experience. And hopefully um, through some of the person-centered tools and ideas that I'm about to share, we'll maybe get some ideas about how they can go about um, creating more gender-affirming, sexuality-affirming services for the individuals that they're working with. So thank you so much for sharing that experience. And uh, as Harmony said, my name is Rhiannon Maycumber, and I'm a certified person-centered thinking trainer. I'm a cisgender white woman. Um, just for accessibility purposes, I'm describing myself. I use she, her pronouns, and I have reddish curly hair, um, and I am wearing a blue shirt with white polka dots. So that's, that's who I am, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a person-centered approach to supporting LGBTQ identified folks uh, who have developmental disabilities. So let's go ahead and get into it. Next slide, please. All right, so today, uh, first I'm going to talk about why a person-centered approach, why person-centered thinking. I'm going to share with you the value of using PCT to really support people who are LGBTQ identified and also have developmental disabilities. And then uh, I'll share with you some examples of using person-centered thinking skills. So some particular tools from the person-centered thinking world and how those can be used to, uh, to serve someone around all of their various identities. And then I'll share an organizational approach with you. So I work with Westside Regional Center and we've been doing work over the last several years to shift our practices to really become that gender affirming, more inclusive organization. So I'm gonna share some tips with you about what's worked well for us. And additionally, I'm gonna share some action steps and resources, things that you can do today, tools that you can use today to, to move forward in the work that you're doing. And next slide, please. So why person-centered thinking? Uh, next slide again, please. So person-centered thinking is all about creating better lives for everybody. Um, that underlying core tenant of PCT, it's all about helping people to gain positive control, uh, meaning to be able to make decisions for themselves, to be able to do the things and live the life that they wanna live in alignment with how they desire to live that life. So helping people get to where they wanna go. Uh, it's also, it's really important when you're using PCT in your work to think about supporting the entire person, the whole person. People are not just their disability. I'm not just, you know, one day a white woman and the next day a sibling of someone with autism. I am, I'm both of those things all at the same time. So really looking at who a person is across the board, understanding their different identities and um, thinking about how you can support them in the ways that those kind of intersect or uh, you know, just different support needs that arise out of that intersection. And also PCT, it, we have these value-based skills that are really focused on learning what's important to a person. So what really matters to a person and supporting them to live a healthy and safe life while achieving those things that are important to them. It promotes deep listening. It challenges us to check our assumptions at the door. And although we might think that you know, a, a person identifies a certain way or should live a certain way, that's not up to us. That's up to the people that we are supporting. And, you know, once we've listened a bit more deeply, we can act in a way that's truly in alignment with how somebody wants to live their life, um, not how we would assume they want to live their life. And 
it's all about helping people to find value and fulfillment in, in their community, to feel like they're contributing to their community. Um, first and foremost, we have to help folks to find that community, especially some of our LGBTQ identified youth, helping them to connect to others um, who share those values and have, you know, uh, an ability to create a safe space for, for others who are LGBTQ identified and, you know, maybe have disabilities as well. So connecting the person to their whole self. And uh, so now I'll give a couple examples using some of the skills in the PCT world and how you can apply those in this work. So if you've ever taken a PCT training, you are familiar with the one page profile or the one page description, they are one and the same. And it's a quick positive introduction to her, who a person is. It covers things that you know we really like and admire about an individual. It covers, um, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not saying next slide. <laughs> Thank you. If you could advance one more. And another one, yeah, forward. Thank you so much, sorry about that. So here we have an example of a one page description and this will probably make more sense now. So this covers what people like and admire about somebody, what's important to them and how to best support them. So how to help people to achieve the things that they wanna achieve while helping keep them healthy and safe. And it can include whatever the person wants it to include. So. This is your opportunity to help someone customize their profile to include things like their preferred name. Um, in this example, you have Taylor Love, who is actually a one-page profile that we get to use in our training now. So Taylor Love is uh, this individual's preferred name. It's not necessarily the name that they were given at birth, but that's how they want it to be described. And they also have it indicated here that ways that you can, you know, support them around their transition is to refer to them as she, her, and to support them by using that uh, preferred name, which is Taylor Love. It also indicates in here that Taylor uh, really connects to her native heritage. So keeping in mind that kind of third piece of information we've already learned about her identity just by having this one page profile. So it's a gender affirming way uh, to, to introduce someone and to maybe even replace those face sheets that we often use that tend to focus on deficits and history and disability, hospitalization, things that you know maybe aren't um, always a positive way to introduce somebody. So this is a tool that can be used to replace that and support someone around their transition and coming out process if applicable. So an example might be, you know, it's important to me to, uh, to keep my sexual orientation to myself when in my place of work. Please don't share my sexual orient orientation if you're supporting me in the work environment. And another one might be, you know, um, help me to make doctor's appointments, but please don't attend those with me um, when someone is, you know, seeking hormone therapy. They, they don't want you in the room because that's private. So that's another way that the one page profile can be used. And, uh, you know, if we can actually go ahead to the next slide. So another example um, to really look at the relationships in somebody's life, uh, it's a powerful tool. It's called the relationship map. And it's used to learn about the relationships that really matter to a person. So um, here you see the family category, the friends category, paid supports, so people who are paid to be in that person's life, as well as school and work supports. So um, if this were my relationship map, my name would be in that center circle, and all of the circles kind of branching off that center circle would include the people who I feel the most emotionally close to. So the closer someone's name is to the center, um, the more emotionally close you know, that person feels to the individual. And using the relationship map, you can as long as you're doing so in a way where you're using, you know, kind of open-ended questions, you're using gender neutral statements, you could really learn a lot about a person. Um, you're communicating respect by not assuming, for example, that because someone is male presenting, maybe they want to date women. So instead of saying, you know, um, do you want a girlfriend? You might say, are you interested in romantic relationships? So using that gender neutral approach to communicate respect and, you know, put your assumptions aside. And then 
you know, consider a chosen family when you're when you're filling this out. So for those of you who might not be familiar with that concept, chosen family is a pretty common um, idea or uh, way that people build community around themselves in the LGBTQ community. So it's people that a person might not be, uh, uh, I'm sorry, might not be blood related to, but they're people that they feel safe around. They're people that, you know, they've built enough of a connection that they consider them family. So you want to include those types of conversations when doing this work. And additionally, you know, it's important to keep in mind that this could sometimes be an emotional process for folks. So especially if they have strained relationships with family members or individuals in their lives who haven't been as supportive during their coming out process, um, this, this might bring up some, some, you know, upsetting emotions. So keep that in mind. And we can go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so, and then just to sum up the, the skills section, I would just say really quickly that we have a link here at the end of the training that includes uh, the learning community for person-centered practices. So if you wanna learn about other skills or upcoming PCT trainings, all of that can be found on that website. Uh, so now I'm gonna share with you our organizational approach at Westside Regional Center, some of the things that we've been doing and some tips from our learning. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we going about creating a more inclusive space at Westside? So some things that we've done, um, we have really began to normalize the use of pronouns. So um, in our email signatures, we've asked people and encouraged people to add their personal pronouns. Uh, and this you know, communicates respect and openness to others who might not use uh, the, their uh, sex assigned at birth uh, pronouns, things that would associate with the sex they were given at birth. And it is also um, being used in our training. So we have name tags when we have person in-person training where we have a space for people to indicate those uh, preferred or personal pronouns. And in my Zoom name, my name is pretty long, so you might not be able to tell, um, but it does say she, her after my name so that people know that those are the pronouns that I use. And we've also been looking at our agency documentation at Westside. So we are kind of in the process of wrapping up a project where we looked at our intake process and we you know, looked at where we could add in a space for preferred name, for uh, personal pronouns, for you know, uh, relationships. So rather than it saying mom and dad on the intake form, caregivers, parents, not actually naming gender there just to be inclusive of all types of families. And we've also been, uh, you know, we, we expect to do this with much more of our documentation. We're in progress with that. Uh, another thing that we've been doing is we've been partnering with uh, LGBTQ plus organizations in our community, as well as other disability focused organizations to come up with kind of an, an, uh, a training that looks at that intersectionality, covers LGBTQ term terminology and identities, and we've delivered that training now uh, across several groups. So we've shared it with our provider community at Westside. We've shared it with our regional center staff, especially our case managers. And we're looking forward in the next couple of months to being able to offer it to our community, to self-advocates and their families. So that's a big step that we've taken, but a one-time training isn't enough. So we definitely are gonna push to keep including that conversation um, hopefully across the state, because you know it's not enough if just one regional center is pushing it. And we've also been connecting individuals to support groups. So different types of support groups, you know, be it um, that are around their disability identity or are for folks who are LGBTQ identified. Um, we've had a, a few options that we've been able to refer people to in the community, which we will of course share with you. And next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, what else are we doing? We have been holding Pride events for the last three years, which have been really an exciting way to bring our community together. Um, we've celebrated history, we've shared art, and we've just in general kind of created a space, a community for any of the individuals we support that are LGBTQ identified and maybe haven't had a space where they've been able to access or come out and comfortably celebrate pride in the, fa in the past. And actually my, my co-trainer here is with me and she's gonna share with you a link to our virtual event that we did last year 
Um, it was really incredible. We had a visual art gallery, including performances from folks who are LGBTQ identified in our Westside community. But because it was done virtually, we were actually able to reach people throughout the state, which was amazing. Um, we had some incredible participation. And this year, we also had another opportunity to do a virtual event where, you know, we had someone from another area uh, throughout the state let us know that they really wished that this was being done um, with their regional center. And they invited us to collaborate with their regional center to grow this work because it is so important and it is, you know, helping people find that community. So uh, additionally, you know, we've been sharing uh, LGBTQ stories in our work as far as our PCT trainings go. We've also shared that work and stories in our community of practices. So um, communities of practice are just a space where we come together and talk about um, how we're using PCT in our work. And one thing that we've had a really amazing opportunity to do was submit a story to the learning community who kind of oversees the PCT world um, and the curriculum. And that story is about a young woman who is trans identified and is going through her transition. And the story is used in the training to help folks in the community who are providers, who are family members, you name it, anyone in our community to really look at um, issues that impact trans youth and what, what is their responsibility, how should they get involved and what is not their responsibility. So um, we're really looking forward to that story being used hopefully globally throughout the PCT training world to build capacity to support our trans community. And um, lastly on the slide, you know, we've been funding some sexuality education groups. We've really been increasing the work we're doing in that area because we constantly hear that this is a need from our community, be it LGBTQ identified or not. Um, so we're funding these groups to help create safe space for exploring sexuality, identity, and healthy relationships. Next slide, please. So examples and alternative services. So I know that's a big focus of the DTI initiative and some of the things I've shared, you know, maybe you are already thinking about how you could apply this to your work in alternative services, but to give some sort of direct ideas, you know, support the individuals you serve to attend virtual pride events. There's also virtual drag shows. Um, one really great thing that's come out of the pandemic is building this community online for folks and having that accessibility to various events going on in the community. So um, I, I, we expect that that's gonna continue. So help the people that you're serving to attend these events if that's something that appeals to them. And then hold discussion groups. So take home activities with folks around topics that are LGBTQ focused. So how to support your friend around coming out, how to be a good friend to someone that's transitioning and holding identity-based art shows where folks can really you know, showcase the part of their identity that they wanna share with everyone else in the program. Um, another thing you could do, of course, is connecting folks to support groups and offering to attend with them, even if that's in the form of a virtual support. And next slide, please. And now I'm gonna share with you what are some things that you can do today and um, some resources to help you get there. Next slide. So in, in PCT, we call a level one, something a level one change when you can literally walk away, you don't need anybody's permission. You can you could do this in the next hour, you could do it tomorrow. Um, and so some ideas that we have for you is attend a virtual pride event yourself, see, see what it's all about. Um, add your personal pronouns or your, your preferred pronouns to your email signatures, to your Zoom names, to communicate that respect and openness. Attend a person-centered thinking training. Um, and then adding that space on your agency's documentation, like Amber mentioned in the beginning, to include um, space for pronouns and given names and you know just more inclusive practices. Uh, tell everyone that you support that you are open to talking about sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, sexuality as a whole, just you know offering that. And you might see folks come forward that are LGBTQ identified and haven't felt that that's something they could talk about in your program. Um, and then provide resources and support uh, information to the people that you know are LGBTQ uh, identified in your services and you know, connect them to those support groups and, and different tools 
that exist. I know Montserrat's going to also speak to some of these tools, so I'm not going to dig into them, but um, there's something called the gender unicorn and something called the coming out constellation that we'll share with you after this training. So hopefully those can be helpful in the work that you're doing. So um, here on this last slide are, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this includes some resources that we pulled together for you specific to the PCT universe, as well as some mental health services, support groups, and more. So uh, I hope that you'll find these useful and Thank you so much. I, I'm seeing that we don't have any questions at this time related to, to this subject matter. So I'm gonna actually hand it over to my co-presenter, Matsura. So go for it, Matsura. Thank you so much for setting that uh, groundwork in PCT uh, training, uh, Rhiannon. Uh, it's definitely gonna help me kind of move forward with uh, the topic today. So let's talk about gender recognition plans. Uh, I'll be providing the service provider perspective uh, from AbilityPath specifically. Next slide. So as we get started, one thing we gotta kind of take, assess uh, what we have in the classroom, right? So keep in mind that my own identity and how I live and navigate through this world is gonna be completely different than what you or how you navigate the world or see the world. The kind of goal here is to, like Amber said, really open our minds and kind of have really have that cultural exchange so that we're able to really uh, learn from each other and grow together, right? So I kind of have this intersection intersectionality bubble, which has an identity at the center. Some common components of identity would be race, religion, nationality, language, migration status, gender, age, sexuality, ethnicity, education, family status, socioeconomics, job, sex, ability, gender presentation, and so forth and so on. The list is really exhaustive, uh, but this is just kind of a starter list to kind of uh, get us started. Uh, keep in mind that, that there also might be some power dynamics going on between myself as a fully uh, body-abled uh, presenter uh, or perhaps you know me being a Latina trans woman. So just keep in mind of those power dynamics. Next slide. Let's go over some of our objective, objectives. So today we're gonna to be able to identify three challenges that trans and gender non-conforming people face. We're gonna select three different ways to support trans and gender non-conforming people in your work and life. And we're gonna learn about the gender recognition form. Next slide. Let's get started with some definitions. Transgender or trans. Someone who's transgender has a gender identity that is different than what they were assigned at birth. Next word, cisgender or cis. A person who's cisgender has a gender identity that matches the one that they were assigned at birth. Gender nonconforming. So if someone who's gender nonconforming basically blurs the boundaries of what society considers as its acceptable uh, gender roles. Gender nonconforming does not automatically mean transgender. Cisgender people can be gender nonconforming as well. Next slide. Personal pronouns. So personal pronouns are actually short words that we use as a simple substitute for people's names. People can use multiple personal pronouns. You always wanna ask what pronoun someone uses and you never want to assume or use pronouns that they don't use. Some common examples are they, he, z, she, z, they, a, Preferred name. A preferred name is a name that someone uses that is not their legal name. Uh, people can also use multiple preferred names. An example of this would be, uh, please remember that this person's name, preferred name is Mikey, not Michelangelo. Next slide. Person first language. Uh, basically, person first language puts the person in front of the qualifiers and kind of changes the way that we speak. An example of this would be trans person versus trans person of trans experience. If you notice in the first uh, kind of version of it, the qualifier, the trans qualifier is qualifying the person. In the second, it's flipped. We focus more on the person and then uh, flip to the qualifiers, right? Next is coming out. So coming out is an experience where a person decides to reveal an important part of who they are to someone in, in their life. So for a lot of LGBTQ plus people, this involves sharing their sexual orientation or their gender identity. 
So coming out is actually an ongoing process due to assumption culture, which we'll define on the next slide. So assumption culture. Assumption culture is kind of the belief that you can tell what someone's race, gender, religion, sex, disability, sexuality, social class, immigration status, nationality, occupation, and other characteristics are just by looking at them. And of course, we can all see why that would not be precise because you can't really look at someone and tell so many things by them just by looking at them, right? So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Let's define our, our baseline here. So what is gender? Gender is the compilation of essential things that make someone a boy or a girl. Most people associate gender with body parts. This ensures that most people with certain body parts are all treated the same. Next slide. But that's not exactly how it works, unfortunately. Next, thank you. Uh, there's actually a lot more to gender. There's a lot of ways to describe it, but I'll give you two of them. There's gender essentialism, which I described two slides ago. It's often used to justify sexism, transphobia, and ambiphobia. And then there's gender performativity. So essentially what gender performativity says is that gender is made up by society. Individuals intentionally or not perform gender through their characteristics, behaviors, and social roles. Characteristics is in a uh, dark purple, behaviors is in a dark red, and social roles is in a dark green. Let's put, go over an example. Alex always loves performing her femininity by making sure they wear makeup and dresses, which is in purple, displays his endless empathy, which is in dark red, and takes on a mother role, which is in dark green, with their siblings because both her parents work long shifts. So keep in mind that those color coding uh, associates with each of the characteristics, behaviors, and social, sorry, social roles. Next slide. Gender is really elusive. There's not really one way to describe it. So here are some words that the LGBTQ plus community might use to describe it. Take some time to learn what some of these mean. Uh, it really help you in your learning journey. Let's go over the next slide. So let's go over some of the challenges and don't worry too much about the text uh, that's on the screen because you'll have it uh, and uh, you'll be able to review it later. Next slide. But in short, society has set up extremely efficient social, medical, legal, economic, and political systems to aid in the oppression of trans and gender nonconforming people as we kind of gathered from today. Next slide. So let's go over some of the social components. Trans people have to deal a lot with stigma and harassment, heightened intimate partner violence, have to de uh, deal with less safety. Next slide. In the medical sphere, we have to deal with uh, health disparities, pathologization and gatekeeping. Next slide. And high attempts of suicide uh, because of the minority stare, uh, stress model. Next slide. Through the legal uh, section, uh, we deal a lot with prisons and policing in terms of profiling and as well as gatekeeping of identity documents. Next slide. There's also legal impunity for perpetrators uh, who often commit crimes against uh, people of color, uh, LGBTQ plus people of color. Next slide. Uh, economic, uh, we're dealing with job discrimination and a higher unemployment rate compared to the general population, as well as housing and food insecurity. Next slide. Political, there's the criminalization of gender affirming care, as well as body inspections and conversion therapy for minors, as well as the delayed response uh, to the AIDS and HIV pandemic. Next slide. So let's learn how to support trans and gender non-conforming folks. The bare minimum to really support uh, gender affirming, uh, sorry, so to support transgender folks is to use gender affirming language as uh, Rhiannon and uh, kind of was mentioning earlier. So let's kind of go over a situational example. Let's say that I see a participant who I perceive to be wearing a skirt. This skirt has a very particular 
uh, green pattern, green checkered pattern. Uh, the participant has really long hair and has uh, really small arms. And I go up into this participant, I tell and compliment them about how cute their skirt is and how beautiful their long hair is, right? In that situation, the participant stares back at me and says, and wonders why I'm coding them as very femininely, given that they're a boy and they don't really understand what's going on. And basically what they go on to explain is that that skirt, what I, what I personally perceive to be a skirt, is actually considered a kilt. And it's a Celtic tradition that their family is very fond of. And that's why that person is wearing that particular item of clothing, right? So not only did I assume what someone's gender was in that case, but I also projected my own personal gender roles and the gender roles that I grew up with onto this person that this didn't necessarily match this other person's uh, culture and way of style, right? So something to kind of prevent those situations is to go ahead and ask what sort of language affirms someone's gender identity, right? Whether that be feminine language, masculine language, androgynous language, or maybe someone doesn't want to deal with gender and they prefer gender neutral uh, way of expression, right? And as a reminder, just never assume, even if someone isn't trans or gender non-conforming, it's really about respecting those emotional relational boundaries that everyone uh, kind of really enforces, right? Next slide. Once again, if, unless it's a slur, you want to use the language that people use for themselves. If someone prefers person first language because they really like focusing on the person and not of who they are, then use that first person language, right? And if you don't know what something means, you always have uh, resources or other communities that can help you learn what that is. Don't put the burden of learning on that person like I did in that situational example, right? One other thing, kind of key word is not to go around figuring out if someone is trans or not, it's really rude. Or even if you do find out if someone's trans, don't, they don't tell other people that that person is trans because it's extremely dangerous as mentioned before in the challenges. Uh, getting found out as being trans or getting clocked is really dangerous, uh, specifically if you're being stealth or blending with, with society's gender roles. Next slide. One other thing that you could do is work on educating yourself. Something that you really wanna remember is to not come with all the answers. Because if you come with all the answers, then it doesn't allow you to grow as a person and really learn and kind of have that cultural exchange that you really should be having with people, right? You always wanna remember your own cultural humility. You don't have the answers to everything and that's okay. You, and also you wanna educate yourself on trans topics. Some common questions that you might wanna ask yourself is, how does someone's trans identity impact or improve other sections of their life? How can someone have contradicting identities? How does that work out? What identities do I share with this person, right? Uh, going back to the identity bubble that we shared at the beginning, uh, there are some identities that, I'm, that I might share with you, some identities that I don't share with you, right? How can I help and cherish and celebrate this trans person's life? What strengths and methods of resilience does this person add to my own worldview? And once again, we really go back to that cultural exchange, right? We, we shouldn't be treating our, the people that we serve as you know, having less knowledge or being less than us, right? They always have a, a method that we don't know about. And given that you know, we, we have a different world experience than they do, right? So we always wanna learn from others. We never wanna have all the answers because having all the answers makes us very rigid. Next slide. And if you need extra support for dealing with any sort of aggressions, uh, whether that be micro or macro, uh, always reach out to Hollaback, uh, who's providing free trainings this uh, Pride Month. And Amanda just dropped the link for their trainings. Uh, Hollaback goes over their five Ds of bystander intervention, which basically are five ways to really intervene in that situation that is escalating uh, to really protect the person that's being hurt, right? There's distract, delegate, document, delay, direct, and so forth. Next slide. 
there's also gender exploration. So gender exploration really kind of takes a step back and forces you to kind of consider what your own gender is like. Uh, because in all reality, gender isn't something that only happens to transgender people, right? So cisgender people deal with gender too. So some questions you wanna ask yourself is, how has shame been used as a tool for controlling my gender? An example of that uh, being facial hair for women. Uh, that's a way that shame has been used to control women. Or shaving legs for men, right? Some, some, it's not okay in some cultures for men to shave their legs, right? Additionally, how do I benefit from my gender expression or my gender being considered normal? Uh, whether that be wearing dresses for women or wearing suits for men. To really relate to the trans community, you, you might wanna ask yourself questions like, what is something that society associates with my gender that is not true to myself? That would most likely associate with gender dysphoria. What gives me happiness with my gender? That's something that most likely correlates with gender euphoria. Some examples of those two that fitting into those would be maybe femininity, masculinity, androgyny, having long hair, doing the splits, or wearing a soft and fluffy sweater. Next slide. To really help with that gender exploration, uh, as Rhiannon also mentioned before, uh, there's the gender unicorn. And Amanda is dropping a link to that interactive uh, software that someone kind of put together. And basically the gender unicorn goes over gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth, physically attracted to and emotionally attracted to, to really explore uh, where that's at for each person at a uh, spectrum level, right? Because everything isn't kind of a solid state. It, it's always kind of changing and very fluid. So uh, kind of use this tool to really help explore that. Next slide. Since we're here for alternative services, uh, we really wanna focus on building back better, right? So a, a really good way of supporting the LGBTQ plus community is to really allot them a lot of space and resources. Some ways that we've kind of done that at Ability Path and encourage other service providers or uh, folks to do is to uh, provide space for an LGBTQ plus participant group or a gender affirming closet. Uh, I know that Rhiannon also mentioned partnering up with other agencies um, and really providing help for those agencies on the ableism front. Uh, is a really good way to really build that community, right? Uh, at Ability Path, we're also kind of working on setting up an LGBTQ plus staff panel uh, to really help those decisions and not really shift the burden on our participants. We don't want them to do all that emotional labor, right? And lastly, but not least, we always want to rely on our regional center supports. Uh, I've personally reached out to uh, the current chair of the Friends Steering Committee to come forward and um, give us a pitch. Uh, I'm sorry, can I get mute? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I've reached out to the regional centers that uh, host our participants and they're working together like uh, West Side Regional Center to really improve their uh, documentation and supports for LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus participants. Next slide. So let's get to the meat of my presentation here. Let's talk about the gender recognition plan. Uh, so the gender recognition plan will also be provided to you. Don't worry too much about it. But basically uh, the plan really focuses on celebrating and kind of getting to that fact finding and establishing the community for this participant who is gender nonconforming or transgender. Something to note is that a lot of the questions that you know, cisgender people have of transgender people are sometimes invasive. So you really want to be, be cautious of what questions get asked and what sort of information gets reported into your systems, right? Uh, so kind of what you really want to look at at through is a uh, business need, need lens. So for example, uh, if someone has fully transitioned and doesn't go by what we would consider their dead name or their former name, there is no reason why the agency necessarily needs that, that name, simply because that person, but for all intents and purposes, goes by their full preferred name, right? So you definitely wanna focus on that. 
regarding gender, you want to ask what gender they are, what pronouns they use. Uh, some examples of genders would be trans man, non-binary, trans woman, gender, gender fluid, gender queer, pangender, so forth and so on. Uh, something to note about pronouns is that they're, once again, not necessarily static, but can also change whether that be on a daily or gender basis. So keep that in mind. Next slide. As we kind of mentioned, uh, really requesting information from our participants can be a really traumatic experience. So we definitely want to do a wellness check and make sure that our participants are doing okay and their basic needs are being met, right? And as mentioned before, even if someone is angry at you or upset at you, really do not take that personally. Uh, because sometimes you got to realize it within your own identity is that you might be part of the system that is constantly uh, failing trans people. And it really doesn't boil down to you. Uh, something to kind of think about is accessing trauma-informed practices, right? Uh, to really better anything that you do with trans people. Uh, additionally, we also kind of focused on setting a baseline for the living situation, what this living situation was. Uh, and you want to definitely make sure that that's supportive. Next slide. I'm running low on time here. Uh, and we definitely formatted everything on a need to know basis. So we kind of made a, a section where we basically build a narrative to what a person would like to disclose and to what level and when, right? We here, the goal is to make sure not to push or not to pry. We really want to uh, support the person. We don't want to embolden them. We don't want to impression them. And we don't want to discourage them. We want to support. That's something that we really want to work on. Next slide. Additionally, you can, you can take time to review over this, but since I'm under time here, uh, you, you want to come up with solutions to when someone gets outed because it's just gonna happen. Um, and it can be very harmful and you always wanna take care of the participant first. That's, that's the only thing that matters. Next slide. Lastly, you definitely wanna find out who a gender affirming support team is for this participant. Uh, as mentioned and explained before, people of trans experience are a lot more happy and thrive when their community is really supportive. And speaking of community and really intersectionality, uh, despite many LGBT plus people being prone to religious trauma, we definitely don't want to assume a disinterest, right? Uh, though we, all, we, we do wanna be careful and make sure that those uh, folks are gender affirming and they aren't causing more trauma than you know, they're kind of counting again. Additionally, trans people exist across all time and cultures, right? So you definitely, don't want to assume that only certain cultures trans people exist in. And you also want to be able to celebrate that person in relation to their culture as well. Next slide. Lastly, last slide. Um, basically, here's a check-in. We, we want to make sure and watch out for any unhealthy behaviors or any kind of unsafe providers for our participants. We want to keep a note of that. And we definitely want to reach out and make sure that they're doing okay at each part of their life. Next slide. Here are some resources. Um, I don't have time for another question. Uh, actually, you know what, I'll do it. Um, so the question is, how do you best respect the many different things you do not know about different pronouns and sexual identities without sounding disrespectful? I've experienced from afar that some individuals get extremely offended by those and that get the pronouns wrong or confuse the sexual identities. And they have, this has not been done intentionally. It has been done out of lack of education. Well, once again, you really wanna focus on that cultural humility um, and you really wanna consider your own identity. And when you offend someone, you definitely wanna make it up to them in whatever capacity you can. And you wanna make sure that that person is taken care of, right? Okay, um, looks like I do still have 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Looks like we're ahead of schedule. Um, so another question is, what a German, uh, German, 
gender affirming closet is. A gender affirming closet is basically a closet that has uh, clothing from what people would consider different genders. So some people would consider a skirt a feminine product. So there, there is some skirts in there. Some people would consider pants masculine. So there would be some pants in there. And basically there's all sorts of uh, clothing that basically allows someone to in their own confidence uh, basically try on and uh, kind of explore their own gender in their presentation. The reason why we do this is because going out and buying clothing of the opposite gender or what people would consider the opposite gender is a very unsafe and maybe, you know, anxiety producing situation. So we definitely don't want to uh, put our participants in that situation. So we would provide them a safe space where they're able to explore and really kind of uh, work through that. Um, I'm sorry, can we go back a few slides? It looks like I do have a lot more time. Let's go back two slides. Another one. Okay, uh, no, that was perfect. Next one. Next one. Next slide, please, sorry. Okay, so as you mentioned before, you, you've, you've kind of gotten the idea that transness is really defined by its relation to pain. And unfortunately for many people, that's kind of true. Uh, so something that Ability Path did is kind of refocus that, that way of thinking into really setting it to a party or an announcement that we help our participants do, right? Uh, this is a great way to really shift that experience of transness from one that is you know, really related to being in the wrong body or, you know, not being the correct gender to one that is a lot happier and celebratory of someone, someone's identity, right? Uh, and, and just something on the side note, that, that whole idea of born in the wrong body is a really outdated, though it's, so, it's true to some people, it's a really outdated notion. A much way, way better way of explaining this would be kind of thinking of genders as being a job, right? Uh, which, you know, you have to wear a uniform to be a very, a policeman. You have to be a uniform to be a doctor. You have to wear a uniform to be a teacher, right? So similarly, gender, you would put a particular clothing or uniform to be a woman, or you would pe put on particular clothing to be a, a man, right? Or you would be a, some particular clothing to be a gender, right? Uh, and you definitely want to kind of associate that, that job description instead of being born in the wrong body uh, because that's not necessarily the best way to describe it. I think I'm gonna toss it over to Amber uh, so she has more time for resources. Uh, so we, if we can skip three slides, I think it is. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for taking the extra time to go back and answer some of the questions that have come in as well as um, getting a little deeper into the gender recognition form. And I want to thank all of our presenters for this rich information. I love the fact that there was so much, you know, so many practical tools that everyone hopefully can come away with today and start to implement. So whether you're using services or whether you are someone who provides services that we all build back better, as Montserrat said, and create a much more inclusive and welcoming, uh, you know, services and, and environments and spaces where people can really feel they can be themselves. And that benefits not just people with disabilities who are LGBTQ plus as well or identify that way, but having inclusive welcoming places helps everybody and for those many 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 different ways people identify um, and there are many many different cultures that they or cultures and communities that they belong to so thank you so much everyone um, next slide please
As mentioned, we are full of great resources. We wanted to make sure that if you are out there and you need a support group or you need more education or you're even maybe struggling um, with your mental health due to, you know, kind of going through any of these processes or, or figuring out where you land or, or how you identify, uh, we wanted to make sure there was something here for everyone. So you're, you will find within the end slides here that we have advocacy organizations. So if that's something that you need support and help with, you'll find that in some of these slides. Next slide. We also have a lot of great video resources. Sometimes for training, it helps to hear more of the personal stories like Harmony. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable and sharing your experience. I do find more often than not that it is really listening and hearing about people's experiences that help us to grow and learn and educate ourselves. So I appreciate that. And you can find more of that as well as other uh, educational resources within these videos. Next slide. So additional educational pieces. Some people just are still a little, I don't know how to kind of navigate this aspect of this topic or that aspect. There is information out there. You just have to find it. And we tried to give you a head start here today. Next slide. We also have many resources in all of these realms, also in Spanish for our Spanish speaking community. We appreciate you being here today as well. A couple slides forward, please. And then also some other culturally specific resources. We know that each person and each culture addresses these topics and uh, approaches these topics in different ways. And we want to make sure that people find that space where they feel they can learn and uh, belong as well. Next slide. And as always, we hope that you find the Disability Thrive Initiative to also be a resource to all of you. We have this Friday our Lunch and Learn, and we always follow all of our webinars with a community conversation. And we do have some of our panelists who will be there to continue this conversation, answer any questions directly from our attendees, and even an additional provider who has really been working hard to create this inclusive welcoming space. And so we hope to see you all there to continue learning from each other and our experiences as we are on this journey. Next slide. We also have our Disability Services Support Center. You can reach out to us through the Support Center if you specifically are looking for any sort of help with your alternative services or getting connected in any way to others out there. We also provide one-on-one -on -one trainings or training for staff and providers. Just reach out, we are happy to connect with you. Next slide. We also have our resource library where you can find all the previous webinars we've done. This one will also be posted there shortly, as well as any materials and information shared. So that is on our website, disabilitythriveinitiative.org. And if you want to receive this information directly, you can sign up for our email list.